Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and um, welcome to this fourth and final panel discussion in the series on scalable computing for pandemic preparedness and resilience. I have been attending all the other sessions and enjoying them, and I hope um, some of you, if not all of you, were on the sessions and enjoying as much as I do. And in this final session, we are going to talk about uh, emerging architectures. So we have uh, three outstanding panelists, each of them brilliant and with a touch of whimsy. So the, the first panelist uh, is Bud Mishra. I know him for a very long time, almost for my, for my entire professional career because he was my advisor, my thesis advisor. And um, <coughs> Bud is a professor at uh, Courant Institute at NYU. And there is no research area that I know of that Bud has not touched. So he has contribution. In fact, he says he is interested in working in what uh, he calls the dark side of computing. So he has contributions in hardware and software, in uh, in robotics and finance and genomics and cancer biology, game theory, and the list goes on. And today, Bud is going to talk to us about his foray into COVID-19. Bud, whenever you're ready. I'm ready, thank you. Can I share a screen? Sure. The... Yeah. And as you're getting ready, uh, just uh, letting the audience know that if you have questions, please put them on chat. And we will be taking the questions at the, at the end of all the three panelists. Thank you. Hold on, I wanna make it bigger. Can people see the screen? Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi, yes, for yes. a kind introduction. So um, Mark Twain talked about the decaying art of lying. I'm gonna focus on two kinds of liars. Some are strangers and some are dangerous. Or in other words, some are variants, some are scariants, or uh, PAMP and DAMP, pathogen associated molecular pattern or danger associated molecular pattern. So the goal is to um, understand and create a self and protect the self from strangers and dangers. And it's hard to know which ones are strangers, which ones are dangerous. So the people who did insurrection on January 6th are not strangers, but they are danger. And Mexican kids, immigrant kids are strangers, but not dangerous. And if yourself is uh, making America great again, how do you deal with that? So um, any question so far? My examples will be a little scary, uh, sketchy. So I hope I don't say anything politically incorrect. So I was not interested in pandemics, but on March 18th, 2020, I was supposed to have an angiogram. And because my cardiologist thought it is not essential, they canceled it. So I got drunk, had a lot of good red wine and went to sleep. Woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare or a dream. In the dream, I'm naked and in a hotel lobby, in a luxurious hotel lobby in India, and there are numbers painted on my back. And I woke up and sent email to people saying it's HLA. The numbers are HLA. And at the dream, uh, they take me upstairs and uh, in a fancy bathroom, robots come out and try to clean my tattoos unsuccessfully. HLA is human leukocyte agents. Uh, and there are various immunogenic genes. Um, uh, HLA is key for organ transplant. Blood groups are another for blood transplant. And bone marrow uh, depends on KIR, KIR. And then there are TLR and interference and a whole bunch of genes. And because the population has to be protected from all of this, they all, uh, often go through uh, negative selection against frequency. So you don't want any particular group to be high so that um, one immunogenic group can survive a pandemic or um, things like that, right? So, and it's, so it's very, very, very polymorphic. Um, 
And we don't understand the biology of that. So my context of my dream is, um, I believe that if we can sequence and understand HLAs, then we can tell um, which humans are asymptomatic, which ones are symptomatic, and get, get control over uh, heterogeneity. And also in case of virus doing information mimicry, we could understand um, the heterogeneity and how the mimicry usually called Mullerian and Bixian, how they change. So it connects us to something called information asymmetry games. So um, not all of us have the same information and information asymmetry and privacy of uh, uh, information in the informed agent uh, creates room for deception. And so we expect a very deceptive game at many, many level. And um, after I emailed that uh, dream, something like 150 people joined my group, uh, joined each other to um, create a uh, online research lab. Uh, and what came out of that is an interesting SAR model, a, a testing method called yet another COVID health testing, yet epicimer and health badge. Um, but it's, it has gotten me interested in understanding uh, innate and adaptive systems and how they interact in a population. So these people, um, many of them are very young. So what we did is use this occasion to teach them virology, epidemi um, immunology, innate and uh, adaptive, epidemiology, and on and on. We'll go come back to that, okay? And so the idea was that we are not going to focus on success, but um, try to fail as cheaply and as quickly as possible. So each individual generated a hypothesis about how to handle the disease, how to handle the pandemics, and uh, then created a minimum viable experiment or project and prune out uh, things that are false, false or falsifiable. And the core idea is to focus on the, uh, the the core part of the unknown unknown. And the students, young people did quite well and the old people, very old people like me, uh, mentored them and some intermediate group, intermediate age people um, managed and guided them. So um, the way I think about the disease and the, so the key question is how do we generate the hypothesis? So, um, this is a picture due to Giordano Bruno on the right with three spheres. And Roger Penrose also uses it. Um, so there are physical, there is a physical world and part of the physical world creates a symbolic world, amino acid sequences, DNA, RNA, et cetera. And then not all of them are um, meaningful. A small part of that creates a signaling world um, between DNA and RNA, RNA and protein, et cetera. And out of those world of um, organisms or uh, new uh, intelligence, a small part of it is used to explain the physical world, right? So this is a very paradoxical picture. Um, and basically it says that because of this recursion, um, the signaling world will never create a uh, truthful, model of the physical world. So one example is that molecules are in the physical world. So ATP, but also UTP, CTP, and GDP. And there are molecular patterns, or MPs, RNAs, and in the symbolic world, and in the signaling world are pattern-associated molecular patterns, sorry, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and danger-associated molecular patterns. And they can, they are the core of the immune system. So, um, so again, here is the picture. In the physical world, virus is made out of ACTG if it is a DNA virus, ACUG if it is an RNA virus. A symbolic world, they make RNA and DNA. Um, they are not, they're distinct from um, our RNA or our DNA. In many ways, our RNAs are short, single-stranded, they can't make copies. 
there's no proofreading, um, but they are connected to each other, DNA to RNA to proteins through codon, anticodon signaling. So not every signaling is possible, only uh, triplets that, are, that code for codons work. In the innate immune system world, these are made out of myeloid cells, dendritic cells and macrophages are the key components, but there are many others and they communicate through cytokines. And the virus will try to avoid the innate cell by biomimicry, by not um, triggering cytokines, cytokine response or cytokine storms, but often our system will respond even to innocuous things uh, with cytokine storm. And as it differs from individual to individual, some will respond with uh, asymptomatic uh, mild response, some will have uh, uh, critical um, or almost mortal responses. Uh, next comes the memory system, adaptive system, which are lymphoid cells. The key components are B cells and T cells, and they communicate through epitopes, and virus will try to hide by creating decoy epitopes, or but we will try to catch them by maturity, um, affinity maturation, and things like that. Uh, then we come up to rational individuals. Uh, the symbolic world is connected by mate pairing, pair bonding, and households, and they're connected by genetics. So HLA is here. So yeah, the HLA is mixed up so that in the urban setting, it works. In the global setting, um, there are certain utilities and they are encoded by rare objects like uh, Bitcoins or gold, etc., and signaling happens by social contract. So, in order to solve this problem, um, our suggestion was to create a game theory model in which all of these are connected together. So, you are not just going to create um, an antiviral that uh, disrupts RDRP, um, like MD server or create a vaccine, uh, create uh, danger signals by putting lipid nanoparticle, but our focus on interferon, IL-6, IL-7, um, epitopes, prefuse and AS spike proteins, IgA, IgM, IgG, a vaccine, um, uh, T cells, vaccines um, that, that are trained and they depend on HLA, TLR, KIR, et cetera. And, uh, and we need to create social contracts so that there is no vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, they maintain masks and distances, et cetera. So that's the problem that we are trying to deal with. And it's a three and a half billion year old problem because the original, oops, can you see? Yeah. The original signaling game happened in the RNA world and um, I'm going to I, I'm going to run out of my 12 minutes quickly. So, in the RNA world, uh, mRNA were the senders, tRNA were the receivers. Uh, mRNA um, uh, created a codon anticodon signaling, and based on that, the amino acids um, invading amino acids can get strong together and become soluble, and um, uh, the toxin toxic effects can be. Um, avoided. So, but then mRNA and tRNA could be deceptive to each other. They cellularize by putting them in one cell so that the information flow is no longer from mRNA to tRNA, but for some uh, encoding in DNA and the DNA creates both mRNA and tRNA and the proteins are not just soluble and toxic and uh, gotten rid of, there are membrane proteins and other things that uh, are used to talk to each other. But some mRNA were left out, oops, and they are still struggling to get into the game. So that's sort of the picture. This is the origin of codon anticodon signaling, and that's the original game. So, uh, and that leads to Crick's dogma, a DNA to RNA to protein, and Crick's dogma essentially says, um, I'm going to skip a lot of things, that you, this is called Baltimore classifications, 
you have seven different kinds of viruses because the information flow restricts what viruses can be created. So group one is double-stranded DNA viruses. Group two is single-stranded DNA viruses. Group three is double-stranded RNA viruses. Group four, which is what COVID is, positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Group five is RNA viruses that are negative sense single-stranded. Um, and reverse transcribing virus uh, like HIV um, is group six. Um, and then group seven is double-stranded DNA viruses with an RNA intermediate. So there are seven kinds of viruses. And we are we learned a lot from group four, but we do have to deal with all of them because they are can come back with the zoonotic events. And so instead of uh, doing drug purposing, here is a set of viruses that are not organized by Baltimore classification, but they respond to different kinds of pathways, interferon pathway, uh, TLR pathways, KIR pathways, et cetera. So the idea would be try to understand the connections and how to structure the information flow and asymmetry to come up with vaccines, you know, some kind of universal vaccine, something like a, uh, a very generalized uh, antivirals. Uh, and, and most importantly, um, educate or inform the individuals, humans in our case, so that they can act rationally and respond to uh, a rational way with informed consent. So information is a key component. I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, so that's the general principle that we taught uh, over about two years to the, uh, uh, to the young uh, students. They coded, uh, they made minimum viable experiments. They uh, failed consistently, cheaply and quickly. Um, and uh, I'm going to, so, so the tests and the interventions are and the modeling got connected. So H is HLA, uh, we assumed that at some point we could test haplotype, HLA haplotypes. You could test antibodies, IgM, IgA, IgG, and PCR antigen testing. And so you know who are susceptible, they have the wrong HLA, they don't have antigen, they don't have PCR negative. Uh, they could be exposed, in this case, they are PCR positive. They could be asymptomatic, they have the haplotype that doesn't, does not express symptoms. Um, and they could be infected and they could be immune. So given this bar coding, one could write down a SAIR model. And that's what we developed though we did not have HLA testing. And we created a um, software called YAT, yet another uh, COVID health testing that use the SAR model and also uh, credible and uncredible threats and uh, costly signaling to uh, make sure that the information asymmetric games uh, converge to good conventional separating Nash equilibria. Uh, so that's what uh, we developed. So it's a mixture of PCR test intervention and um, antiviral drugs. Not all of it is available. One of the problems is that we don't have a good te te technology for uh, detecting the right haplotype for the HLA. Uh, fortunately, we are starting a nanomapping technology company that has gotten seed funding. And hopefully in two, three years, we'll be able to do that. So uh, the YAT has a... Um, uh, has is in step one, a user comes, is recommended a pool in which the saliva can be tested within a time interval. Usually there are machines that can do it in eight minutes. The user selected to be pool tested and the pool test result is negative. The user is given a badge, negative non-counterfeitable plastic wrist badge, encrypted electronic badge or a crypto coin badge that lasts a predetermined period. So if you belong to a negative pool, you're immediately safe to and go out and mingle. On the other hand, if the user selected to pool tested and the pool test result of the user for the pool is positive, then the user is given an unsafe match from single test. 
but then randomly he's sele- he selected in another pool and the pool size decreases if the test positivity rate is high uh, ultimately in the limit you could test an individual with a single pool, a pool that has only single individual but by, by the run length uh, probabilistic analysis shows that um, there are only four or five uh, pools one might, one can go and you can uh, skip that by going to a single uh, user pool test and and we um, uh, control the parameters of the system uh, which is like a market system uh, so that um, PCR tests, accurate PCR antibody tests that we need for say our model could be worked out. So this was implemented and uh, resulted in a system called Health Patch that was used in India, tested in India, in IIT Jodhpur, IIT, IIT, Triple IIT Hyderabad and IIS Bangalore. And, and there was supposed to be more of a community health effort but that's uh, in the back burner now. To so the, from a questions answers, so one question the question is how could HPC help you? Yeah, what is the architecture? Um, my proposal would be to use the computational power in a distributed way so that with very large number of very individualized hyperlocal hypothesis testing can be done quickly and the results could be used in transfer learning to other areas. And the, the idea is to mingle intervention with testing and drugs. So the R not is small. Um, another, another example, which I had thought about for a long time, 10, 20 years ago is malaria in India, which has an R not of 0.895. Is 0.85 um, malaria could just disappear in five years. So for the malaria, the interventions are mosquito nets, killing the parasites, but not with DDT and um, good drugs so that the recovery time is short. But um, malaria also has um, asymptomatic uh, carriers, which are detected when women go for pregnancy tests. So the computational infrastructure for flu, for COVID, for Nipah, et cetera, or could be also used for something like malaria, which is a third world disease and maybe we don't have to worry about it here. But, um, but the computational architecture could be very rich, could be hi- very hyperlocal and aggregated in an interesting way. And anyway, I think I'm being told to stop. Uh, thank you, but that was uh, fascinating, and I'm sure people are bubbling with questions. But we'll have to hold on uh, okay. uh, till the uh, uh, till the end of the panelists' uh, presentations. So our uh, next uh, panelist is uh, Rick Stevens. Uh, Rick is associate lab director at Argonne National Lab for Computing Environment and Life Science Research, and uh, he's a professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. Uh, Rick works on problems at the intersection of HPC, AI, genomics, drug discovery, diseases, and scientific computing. And he is one of the leaders in the US uh, Exascale Computing Initiative and is working hard to create a new national initiative in AI for science. Uh, Argon will be the home for one of the US Exas exascale machines called Aurora. And as if all this were not enough to keep him busy, he makes the time every day to do some coding. And today he's going to uh, talk to us about his foray into COVID-19. Okay, thanks, Ajmi. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Can you guys see the title slide? Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, all right. So um, I'm... I'm going to talk about what we did at the beginning of the pandemic for, and actually for about uh, two years um, and how it relates to computer architecture as kind of a bridge between the, the fascinating uh, kind of uh, wandering through conceptual space that Bud talked about and the, and the uh, detailed architectural stuff that I think Andy might talk about. So um, 
when the pandemic started, um, I was actually in the middle of a whole bunch of travel and uh, holed up in Puerto Rico actually to work on AI models to try to see if we could um, scale up some of the ideas we had, we had been developing uh, for cancer uh, to look for antivirals on, uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. In that, in that kind of a couple of week interval where nobody knew what was going on before everything shut down, we had managed to assemble about 200 people that um, started working on this problem. And it was a kind of a self-organizing, somewhat similar to what Bud talked about. Um, and what we were trying to do in uh, a one part of that group was to uh, essentially attack all of the molecular targets that we could identify in SARS-CoV-2 um, against uh, very large libraries of small molecules that we had been accumulating. And, and to do that search, which uh, at the end of the day, when you do the back of the envelope, it would have been about um, 800 billion searches, 800 billion molecular screens against uh, these targets, uh, we realized that we couldn't do it, even with access to all the big machines that we could beg, borrow, and steal from our friends, it was not going to be possible to do this with a brute force classical biophysics-based search. And, and so we started down the path of building AI surrogates um, that could do this search much faster. And so the idea was to train uh, deep learning models for every receptor uh, that we had extracted from, uh, the, from the structural, uh, from the proteome of the virus, um, and then uh, train that on actual biophysical data, and then, uh, validate these models against you know, large scale screen data and then do massive inference. Uh, and what I'm gonna tell you is kind of how we uh, did that um, and, and all the different things that we needed to do on computing to do that. So this was the kind of practical lists. So if you're imagining what might happen in future pandemics, it's gonna be some version of this. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's more to it. There's the epidemiology, there's the, zoonotic host screening that needs to be done. There's uh, the kind of more theoretical things like Bud was talking about. Can we imagine different scenarios? Of course, we need to do this for all the virus families. You know, and we have all this information. It's not like um, the virology community has been asleep. We have a lot of information about viruses. We're not doing a lot of surveillance that we need to do, but we could do better at that. Um, so let me just walk through the practical problems. This is a, you know, this series of workshops is kind of about what practically might we need to do to be better prepared, right? So the first thing was getting people together, right? We use Slack, we use email, we use Zoom. That was you know, already kind of working. Our earliest kind of hard problem to solve was we started accumulating large amounts of data, many terabytes, and we needed to share it quickly to hundreds of people. That turned out to be actually non-trivial. We used Box, we used Globus, we did ad hoc things. Uh, we never really solved that problem effectively um, because we, we needed programmatic access to generate large data sets and quickly share them. The Globus team was uh, kind of on call 24 seven and, and made huge progress in, in enabling that. So that was good, but it's still not really completely solved. One of the big first tasks was to gather uh, all the molecular data that we could get our hands on from small molecules. And this turned out to be about uh, four uh, terra, four um, billion molecules worth of data. Now we actually have about a hundred billion molecules worth of data, but at the time, uh, two years ago, it was about four billion. This is the open databases from about 25 uh, sources. And we then had to integrate that data and compute descriptors and so on. And that took about 2 million CPU hours. And it was a collection of tools. And this more or less ran on any ADX, AD, sorry, x86, platforms we could get our hands on. It was different machines at different places, down in Urbana, down in, down in uh, Texas, down in San Diego, Argonne, um, Oak Ridge, uh, places in Europe and so on. Um, that resulted in about 60 terabytes of data. So 4 billion molecules and lots of different uh, properties of those molecules that we used for different kinds of screens and different kinds of searches. The second major task was um, gathering and curating all the molecular targets. So as Bud was saying, you know, this is a single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, it codes for um, around 30 proteins, um, and maybe two-thirds of those proteins are viable uh, targets in the virus. There's another couple hundred targets in the human that you could go after in the host. 
Um, and because SARS-CoV-2 was very similar to SARS-CoV-1, and there had been a lot of molecular work already done on SARS-CoV-1, so a lot of the targets had preliminary models that were derived from one, and as uh, data from two started to become available, uh, the sequence data, you could do homology um, modeling, uh, people had started uh, to do some crystallography work. So we ended up with a, a pretty good collection of targets. In the end, around 100 receptor models that we built from these targets. So in a given protein might have multiple uh, receptors, places that small molecules could bind to that. Um, to do this work, we had to do a lot of ad hoc activities. And this used a lot of molecular dynamics. It used PyMol. It used uh, some tools that ran on GPUs, some on CPUs. We used a lot of different machines. Nowadays, we would have leveraged a lot more things like AlphaFold2. Um, we were doing some homology-based modeling from SwissProt and so on, but this was, I would say, uh, so a, more of a black art component. We had maybe 30 people working on this part of it, but um, and we'd be much better at doing that now, uh, post kind of uh, AlphaFold2. Uh, the receptor modeling was very specific to the tool chains, and I would say this became a big bottleneck because it was human expert limited to validate them. Um, I think in the future, we need AI pipelines that can do this automatically and check them. Uh, and we've actually got PhD students working on that now. So this idea of automated uh, receptor building, um, and, there, and there's a lot of biology involved in that and, and mechanistic uh, kind of hypotheses that you come up with depending on, on the particular mechanism of the, of the protein target. So that's, that's open research, but for that, um, again, x86 and GPUs were what we needed. You know, we tried running a lot of stuff on power. We couldn't get the tools ported so that, you know, uh, Summit was available, but we, we could only use uh, it in limited ways. Then we had to build training sets. Turns out that the um, drug screening, biophysics drug screening, ran pretty well on x86 and in some cases GPUs, uh, depending on which tool chain you were using. And we typically trained on about, or gener a screen on about a million diverse compounds to build a model, uh, train the AI on that data, and then did inference on the much larger data set, right? M much, much, much larger. Once we had those models built, we could do inference on lots of different devices. We could do inference on CPUs, on GPUs. We could then take those models. Um, we could re retrain them on AI accelerators. And so, for example, we used the uh, Cerebrus CS1 at the time. Uh, we used Sambanova. We used other AI accelerators to uh, build and, val and validate uh, these models. And then we did massive inference runs. So we had the 60 terabytes of data that would that was the input to the AI codes. Um, and, you, and so you could think of these AI models as surrogates for virtual docking. Um, and the reason that we needed to do the surrogates is that the the classical biophysics tools like OpenEye, FRED, or Autodoc, Vina, or whatever, have a throughput that's on the order of one uh, molecule per second um, against a target. And so we had about 100 targets, and we had 4 billion molecules to screen against that. So it was not going to, that, that was a, a very long time. Whereas the AI models initially were about 50,000 times faster. So we had a 50,000 X speed up by using the surrogates. By the end of the program, we had gotten the AI surrogates up to 20 million times faster. And so um, that's, that's one kind of thing that we learned, okay? Another thing that uh, has become apparent since then, and we've been doing work on this, I would say it's still in progress, but we had to pre-process the molecular data to produce features that we could do the um, deep learning training on. And we tried lots of different kinds of features. We tried molecular descriptors, molecular fingerprints, images, raw smile strings, and so on. Subs at the time, the best performing models were a combination of descriptors and images. But you needed the, you had to compute on each molecule to produce those descriptors or those images and that, and you had to make that pass on say 4 billion molecules. Now we have 100, over 100 billion molecules generating these derived featureizations of those molecules would be a huge bottleneck. So we're back to trying to uh, learn directly from the structure of the molecule itself using transformer models. And that's starting to, to show some success. So in the future, the future version of this pipeline would, would probably skip the process of actually having to produce descriptors that would reduce the volume. But we also have moved more towards a dynamic generation of molecules. So a future version of this would have even more emphasis on the AI um, hardware. Um, so 
what's my uh, kind of bottom line? This is, I mean, I, I this is, I don't want to spend too much time on the talk, but you know, we had the screen targets. We, you know, the targets were in all the different stages of the virus replication cycle. Um, these are cartoons. Um, we of course got uh, hits from these screens. We ordered molecules, and we had collaborators synthesizing molecules, and we did wet lab validation whole. Uh, cell assays, whole virus assays, as well as functional assays. Um, we found over 60 uh, compounds that were uh, were active, and from those we derived another 600 molecules that were biologically active. And these are in various states of downstream development as antivirals. Just to give you a picture of what one of these looks like, this is a um, one of the proteins, NSP15, and the binding site was like, say, this blue region, which is where a small molecule would where an inhibitor would bind. Um, these are what we call receptor models. And um, uh, you get tables out. You can screen, say, a, a million molecules. You get a table that has a predicted score for how well it's, uh, say, binding to the site. Um, and that's what you would use as input to your AI models. Um, this was a paper that we published on the big collection, uh, which is now uh, very small compared to the data set that we have. Um, different ways of representing the molecules, which I talked about. So what did we learn? This is kind of my last slide here. So first of all, it was super important that we had in the center. So we, we, you know, very early in the pandemic, I sent email to all the center directors that I knew, friends and so on and said, look, we need access to your machine. We're trying to do X, Y, and Z. And people gave us time, right? It was uniformly, anybody we asked, they gave us time. This was before the national consortium for COVID was created. So this was an informal consortium. Uh, where people were sharing. Um, but of course, we couldn't sh easily share data between these ad hoc collections of DOE machines, NSF machines, and so on. So in the future, we actually have to, we have to have in place already a data sharing kind of foundation to make this possible. That's one of the lessons that we learned. Second thing was that it was super important that we could run off the shelf tools that maybe weren't in production use at the supercomputer centers that are typically maybe desktop tools or other things. So it was super important that these machines could run, say, Linux binaries, things like just stupid things like that, right? Python code, you know, almost ever, all the workflows were written in Python. A subset of these critical codes had already been ported to GPUs, but of course, new, new GPUs nowadays, like from, from AMD or Intel, would, wouldn't necessarily have ports. And so um, this notion of how fast you could get something to run on a new accelerator becomes super important. If you, if you basically can't get it running in a few days, you move on because you don't have any time uh, to deal with that. So this is, a, a, I think, a, a big lesson learned. It buys you towards you know, production. Once we had identified clear AI uh, places in our workflows for very specific AI uh, functions, AI components of the workflow, we could then focus on the AI accelerators, right? Where they didn't you know, they weren't fully integrated into the big infrastructures, but we could say, look, this is a TensorFlow model or a PyTorch model. We, here's the training set. We could train it there. We could run it there. Um, that was critical to getting on the accelerators like the Cerebrus uh, machine that, that uh, Andy was helping us with at the time. And a little bit after that, we started building hybrid workflows where we would chain together computation on x86, on GPUs, and on the AI accelerators, either by using AI accelerated molecular dynamics or running end-to-end uh, -end workflow and taking the different components that needed specific architectural support and getting them running on a given machine. But that also then now raised an issue about orchestrating these complex workflows across multiple centers. And we had teams working on that. And that also uh, you know, ran into various kinds of barriers about how easy it was to SSH into sites, you know, multi-factor authentication, data sharing, and so on, which all those kind of infrastructure things are just as important as the underlying architectures. We often had to port things quickly to an architecture that uh, wasn't the original target. And when we gave up, we you know, then, then adjusted the workflows to which machines we, we um, actually had. So the bottom line for the future, if we're trying to imagine what computing environment and the underlying architectures we need in that environment for the future, first of all, we need a diversity of machines. We need a large fraction of the machines to be things that are not experimental because we need them in a production kind of mode. But to the degree that we have, say, special purpose accelerators that give us orders of magnitude improvement on certain components of the workflow, 
within a few weeks, if we have enough access to the experts, we can get those to be embedded. And so it doesn't rule out specialized architectures. It just means that those have to be embedded in a functional environment like the supercomputer centers and then wrapped you know, in a lot of things that we know how to do, support infrastructure and so on to do this. Later, when the consortium was created, um, the National HPC you know, COVID consortium, there were also participation from the cloud vendors from Microsoft and Google and Amazon. And those resources also became available. Um, but very few groups, even in the time when these resources became available, were actually trying to orchestrate complicated workflows across the infrastructure. Mostly they were using individual resources. And I think going forward, it's much more likely, kind of like what Bud was saying, you know, this leverage the distribu distributed nature of everything and increase the diversity and risk taking that people would have in trying things. And I think that's probably the bottom line, I would say. We need advanced architectures to accelerate things and we need people to be able to take risks and, and fail quickly and move on. And I'll, I'll stop there. Hand it back to Lexman. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Uh, fascinating talk. And I'm going to remind uh, the audience that feel free to uh, place your questions in, in the chat. And after our third panelist, uh, we, we will be having, we'll take your questions and we will start the discussion. And um, our next panelist uh, is um, Andy Hawk. He is uh, Vice President and Head of Product at uh, Cerebra Systems, an AI computer systems company building truly revolutionary systems for AI and HPC at scale. And uh, his team works with data scientists, researchers, engineers, and customers to build systems that radically accelerate AI for scientific industry and government applications. So previously, Andy worked uh, with uh, Google, and he's a scientist and a researcher by background, very interesting background. His undergraduate work is in astrophysics and molecular biology, and his PhD is in geophysics and space physics. And he's a proud alumni of NASA's Astrobiology Academy. So, and today he will talk about his foray into COVID-19. Andy, whenever you're ready. Of course. Thanks, Lakshmi. And um, what an honor to be here. This is a really insightful and interesting panel and a, a, and a, a topic that I think is, is close to all of our interests and in our, in our health. Um, um, so thank you to NSF Prepare. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thanks, uh, Bud and Rick. I'm looking forward to some interesting discussion after this. Following the trend of the earlier panelists, we went from sort of uh, theory-informed testing with Bud to uh, to practice and informed lessons on, on, on HPC for future pandemics with Rick. And then under the theme of, uh, of emerging architectures in HPC, I'm gonna focus in a little bit more on a particular architecture for uh, deep learning, AI and HPC computing that we've developed at Cerebrus um, that, is, that is informed by those kinds of computing workloads. So I'll bring up the slides. Um, as Lakshmi mentioned, my name is Andy. I'm the VP and head of product at Cerebra Systems, uh, where we're building a completely new class of computer processor and system to accelerate artificial intelligence by orders of magnitude beyond what's possible with traditional processors like CPU or GPU. So. I wanted to start this with just a statement of the challenge and opportunity as, as I see it from my desk at Cerebrus that AI and, and HPC have fundamentally transformative potential uh, to improve how we prepare for and respond to pandemics such as COVID-19. Um, to do things like AI powered drug discovery, biomedical and life sciences research to improve therapy development, clinical decision-making, and every, everything towards even social network modeling um, or modeling outbreaks. Um, traditional HPC physics-based modeling and simulation can of course be used as, as, as Rick was describing uh, for processes ranging from, from drug discovery um, to modeling climate and outbreak. And we're seeing an emergence 
of workloads that actually live at the intersection of deep learning and HPC. For example, using AI as surrogate models for traditional physics-based modeling, or using AI to inform high precision traditional physics-based models. So it's a very interesting space, um, but there are a couple of challenges that are common to those domains that restrict our ability to, to achieve this, this full potential. First is that these workloads across the board have massive and growing computational requirements. And often many of these workloads involve not just a high degree of computation, but also require high bandwidth memory access and communication bandwidth that makes them very difficult to scale across traditional infrastructure. So traditional systems are indeed suitable and have brought us a long way, but they're not necessarily the optimal computing infrastructure for this set of workloads. If we had a better solution, um, we might be able to identify potential therapies sooner um, and respond more quickly. So the question that I hope to answer today is how can emerging architectures like the one that we've developed at Cerebrus help? I wanted to take a step to the side and, and, and examine for a moment the, the, the case study as an example of some of these challenges that we see in deep learning and neural networks. This chart shows the exponential growth of memory and computing requirements for state-of-the-art artificial intelligence models just over the past few years. What's shown in this chart is the total training compute requirement and, and memory requirement for state-of-the-art models, particularly here used for natural language processing in deep learning. And what we observe is that between 2018 and 2021, um, the computing requirement grows for these state-of-the-art models by three orders of magnitude, 1800X. Models are growing in size from hundreds of millions of parameters to hundreds of billions of parameters. And tomorrow we may even expect, expect multi-trillion parameter models to be common. So there's an exponential growth in compute. And the fundamental challenge here is that distributing these large scale workloads across traditional infrastructure does not allow us to scale very well. Um, this chart uh, from SIGARC 2020 shows the speed up in time to solution as a function of the number of chips applied to an, an AI model. And what we can see if, if we just highlight, say one of these points in the center of the chart is that as you scale from zero to 30 16 GPU systems, so a total cluster size of 480 GPUs. Ideally, if you had ideal linear scaling, you would scale up by 30x to achieve that, that full performance and achieve faster time to solution. But what we see is that as you scale from one to 30, you actually get less than 10x acceleration in terms of time to solution. So the limits here are that the state of the art and emerging workloads need massive memory bandwidth, massive communication bandwidth that is a challenge for traditional clusters as well as tremendous computational resources. Um, all of these requirements for compute memory and communication become intertwined as you distribute large workloads over many small processors. And this is a requirement for those, those traditional clusters um, to have fine-grained partitioning and coordination of memory and compute and communication across, in some cases, thousands of devices. And not only is this inefficient, but the complexity of programming scales dramatically with cluster size. And so as Cerebrus, we took a fundamentally different approach to large-scale AI computing. Um, and we are, by way of introduction, an AI computer systems company. And we're building a system to accelerate AI, not by a little bit, but by a lot with the hope of fundamentally transforming the compute landscape to allow researchers and developers to not only go faster with existing workloads, but also to develop completely new AI models and capabilities. 
Uh, we were founded in 2016. We're based in California. We're now actually over 400 engineers. We have offices around the world and growing customers across multiple verticals um, internationally as well. The heart of our solution is a new purpose-built AI processor that we call the wafer scale engine, shown here on the left. It's the largest chip ever built by more than a factor of 50. On this single device about the size of a dinner plate, we have 850,000 fully programmable cores that are optimized from the ground up for sparse linear algebra operations that are foundational to both deep learning work and HPC. We have 40 gigabytes of on-chip memory and all of the cores on the chip are connected directly to one another over a high bandwidth over silicon mesh. So this gives us orders of magnitude, more memory bandwidth and fabric bandwidth than is possible on a traditional processor. In a sense, you can think of the wafer scale engine as a, a cluster worth of deep learning compute resources all on a single chip. Once we arrived at that as the right architecture for deep learning computing, we had to fundamentally rethink the server or the physical chassis that would house, power, cool, and deliver data to that massive high-performance engine. And for that, our team designed and built and is now delivering the systems shown here. We call this the CS2. Uh, the CS2 system is the world's most powerful single node AI computer. Um, it deploys into a standard data center rack and connects to data center facilities and adjacent infrastructure over standard connections. So you can think of this as, as a very, very high performance network attached accelerator for your AI or HPC workloads that can be a part of, as Rick mentioned, a, a diverse or heterogeneous HPC and AI cluster. Rick also mentions the importance of uh, programming through standard tools and, and, and production workflows. So at Cerebrus, we've invested significantly over the years in building a software stack that meets data scientists and ML researchers where they are, allowing them to program the CS2 with standard ML frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch, allowing your research scientists to focus on solving those fundamental biomedical and life sciences problems associated with uh, problems like the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to programming our machine for, for deep learning applications with frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch, we have also developed a lower level software development kit that allows researchers and software engineers to build custom applications and algorithms on our machine for, uh, for, for HPC or traditional physics-based modeling and simulation applications. This entire software ecosystem is built to allow users to access that cluster scale performance on our machine with the programming ease of a single node so that they no longer have to think about the, the traditional complexity of distributed programming uh, across uh, a traditional cluster. I'll shift gears and just talk about a few concrete, exciting use cases that illustrate the, the value of, of this particular architecture um, for, for AI and HPC work. One of our machines typically delivers the performance of many tens to hundreds of, of GPUs for, for deep learning work. And we see this performance translate into real value in terms of reducing time to insight and enabling new capabilities across multiple verticals. For example, at, at Argonne National Labs, Rick mentioned earlier some of the work that uh, the team at Argonne had been doing on, on cancer modeling. Um, we, we did some of our initial work at Cerebrus accelerating that model, allowing it to run hundreds of times faster than it could run on a conventional GPU, enabling the team there to uncover insights in a few months that would typically take years. Um, at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, the team there is using 
our AI system alongside a traditional HPC system to drive AI informed physics simulations, allowing them to open up the doors to new types of experiments that the team hadn't been able to run there at the conjunction of AI and HPC. And over on the far right, um, in, in commercial pharmaceutical and drug development, the team at AstraZeneca is using our machine to train large language models that typically took them weeks to run on a cluster of GPUs in just a few days, radically reducing the amount of time it takes them to run single experiments, allowing them to increase the cadence of experiments, as well as retraining models to, to keep them up to date with the changing landscape of their data. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into just a few examples here. One is the work that we've done with GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, they recently published a paper shown on the left where using one of our first generation systems, the CS1, they were able to train a, a large BERT type model for a completely new application on a completely new data set, 160 times faster than they could with a GPU, which allowed them to unlock new research and create a new AI model. This new AI model they call eBERT. It's a model trained with both DNA sequence data as well as epigenetic data to model cell type specific gene regulation and function for genetic medicine development. So this is an example where the performance of a computer system, our CS1, allowed their researchers to experiment more quickly with larger and different data sets and fundamentally develop a, a new capability. But it's not just strictly used for deep learning work. We also are doing work accelerating traditional physics-based simulation. Here with Total Energies, the energy company, um, we demonstrated 100x speed up compared to GPU for a, a physics-based simulation workload that's used to process seismic data. Um, this traditional physics-based simulation code is applicable to a wide range of real-world problems, uh, ranging from battery development, biofuels, modeling wind flows, um, or even uh, public health and, and pandemic-related problems like climate um, and, and outbreak modeling. So here, the Cerebra CS2 outperformed uh, GPU by 100x using code that was written with the software development kit and uh, Cere Cerebra software language that I mentioned earlier. And the system is now up and running. Last but not least, uh, we're very proud of the work that we uh, did recently with, uh, with ANL that resulted in a, a, a finalist selection for the Gordon Bell COVID-19 HPC Special Prize. Um, this work, uh, shown in the publication to the right with the link down at the bottom, um, was using AI models alongside traditional molecular dynamics and finite element analysis simulations to better understand SARS-CoV-2 replication transcription protein complex. Um, in this, a heterogeneous system of both GPUs and uh, AI accelerators, including the CS2, the CS2 was used to accelerate training of a convolutional variational autoencoder an AI model that was used in this case to model local conformational change uh, and characterize that for the protein complex under study. The CS2 here delivered the performance of, of over 100 GPUs, allowing faster research, more frequent iteration and retraining, and also allowed the team here to use other assets in that heterogeneous HPC cluster for the work that was better suited to those other architectures. So in conclusion, I'm really excited for subsequent discussion on this panel and happy to be here today to introduce uh, our architecture, the CS2, an AI optimized machine that enables push button programmability and scaling for these, this emerging class of very large problems. We accelerate deep learning and HPC by orders of magnitude beyond traditional architectures and performance here importantly as a, as a researcher myself, translates into real value related to pandemic preparedness, faster research and discovery, the ability to test and iterate over more hypotheses per unit time, 
or allow research teams to bring larger data sets to their problem to build fundamentally more accurate, new, different models and capabilities that may not have been accessible or practical before. And also enable more efficient use of heterogeneous HPC infrastructures. As we look into the future and think about optimized HPC infrastructures for future pandemics, I, I expect that we'll see an expanded use of, of AI models, either on their own or as a complement to traditional physics-based modeling and simulation. Uh, I think it's clear that emergent architectures like CS2 deliver transformational value, uh, allowing researchers, for example, to cast a wider net of hypotheses and more quickly explore this complex and large space of protein structure and interactions, say for drug discovery, improving the odds that we could identify potential threats or vaccines sooner. I also think that what we learned and, and, and what Rick talked about a few minutes ago about making available high performance heterogeneous HPC infrastructure to our global family of scientists and researchers is critically important. And that that HP that that uh, infrastructure is, is best suited to a wide range of problems if it's a heterogeneous AI and, and HPC cluster where we're researchers can take a, a best athlete approach to identifying and using and mapping their workloads to the underlying compute that's best suited for that work. And this and in, in the future, we welcome the opportunity to work together. Um, and so thank you. I'm looking forward to the questions and discussion on the panel. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you to all the uh, panelists. Um, feel free to post your questions or, you know, you can raise your hand in Zoom. So le let me, uh, let me um, start off by a, a question is that uh, fascinating talks, all the three talks were fascinating, uh, touching on um, uh, different aspects. And for this is a question to all the three panelists for uh, in, the, in the future pandemic preparedness, what is the balance you see between the machines and the scientists? I mean, faster computers, bigger computers, or, and uh, creative and better ideas from, from scientists. I'm sure we kind of need both. And what have we sort of learned from this one and what do you, um, see the future, what is the balance between the, the two? Well, so bond, okay. Uh, wh whoever you wanna go for it, Lexman. Uh, Rick, you can, you can go ahead, yeah. I was gonna say, you know, we're pretty good at, at uh, figuring out how to make computers faster and we're pretty good at buying them and getting them installed and, um, and you know, making them available. We're really bad. <laughs> at uh, teaching people how to think differently about new problems. And this is where, why I think Bud's uh, talk at the beginning was so important because what we found is that, you know, if you can organize a big team of people and if you have a problem that needs a lot of people working together, you can get that done. And, 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 and the infrastructure courses, you know, at the, at the time you have an emergency, you, you have what you have, right? You, you, you go to war with the army you have, but, um, what really would make a difference and what did make a difference for us was um, how fast we could try new ideas. And I think that's, and, but what we didn't make a whole lot of progress on was the rate at which even crazier ideas were generated by people. Um, I mean, there were some and, and it was good and it, and it helped not, you know, most of the new ideas are, are not going to pan out, right? This is the whole idea, but uh, but I think we need to really work on that last part uh, is teaching people or creating environments and where people's innate uh, creativity can emerge. And I, I want, really want to hear Bud's answer to this question too. Yeah, no, that's, I think you said it. I think uh, there'll be pandemics, there'll be other crises, there'll be wars. It's not going to be some big super AI will take us over. 
you'll be some crazy guy with nuclear weapons or a crazy virus. Uh, so what we need are, but the interesting thing about the day after or two days after my dream was there were hundreds of people willing to talk and think about it. And many of them were young uh, and they could code, they could do Python, they could do Julia, but uh, they didn't know biology. But, it, but how do we keep that coming? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we teach a whole bunch of courses about deep learning, a whole bunch of courses about architecture. We never teach people how to solve problems and, and the courage to fail and fail design falsifiable hypothesis that will fail. And when it fails, how do you communicate that, right? I mean, failure is not something that should only influence you and you should hide in shame. In some sense, you want that to be communicated so that this, uh, you know, zero to one has lots of zero to zero. 80% of the efforts will be zero to zero. How do we know those zero to zeros? But every, every uh, and failure I, should result in new things to try, right? Right, and that's but it idea. should be communicated, it should be, Right, uh, I should be able to Google say, "Tell me the most interesting failure today." Right, uh, right. Just as, Facebook just as much... should be sending, "We move fast and broke more things today." Exactly. Yeah, just just as much These as we log our, our successes, we ought to log and make searchable the the, the failures, the the, the right. hypotheses that were not supported. That's right. right. I mean, the reason on, we we, we so on the other that. hand, I'm very impressed by. The fact that uh, most of the things we are using were known since 1902 by uh, Roland Ross in Calcutta, who figured out malaria, malaria parasites, SIR model, you know, anopheles mosquitoes, and got uh, and uh, did amazing things. And he, so it, the math and and the compute power he had was not that much. And he got the Nobel Prize, second Nobel Prize in biology and physiology, 1902, 1901. Prize was a hoax, right? So, but still, there are people dying of malaria. So why not take on a problem like malaria? And it has, it has all the complexity. There is heterozygous advantages, connection to thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, population structures. So. It's not, I think scientifically, uh, my hero is Roland Ross, Ross Ronald Ross. Um, so what do we do more? Who is the you know, young people who could come up with understanding something through multiple failures? I, 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 I don't wanna keep talking about fail cheaply, fail quickly. I've gone to the dark side as Lakshmi said, but I've failed miserably many times. Most inter interesting problems are failures, um, you know. So, just just anyway. briefly, I, I wanted to I wanted to build off of that, but I, I think I think that is critically important. And in some sense, I think it it calls back to the recommendation to 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 build infrastructure that is not just high performance, but but accessible to to more organizations, more users, and at the individual user level provides mm -hmm. sufficient resource, whether that's time or, or, or magnitude of compute, such that the, the set of ideas that they want to test is not just sort of a, a, a minimum viable publishable unit that they can, they, they can afford in the sense of, of access to HPC resources mm -hmm. to try bigger ideas or try ideas that, that might be less likely to result in success or substantiation of an existing hypothesis, but that they essentially are, are not resource bound to try only the, the ideas that are likely to succeed or pan out in a publication, but that there's sufficient resource there that they can take a crack at that right. sort of oddball hypothesis that might be lower right. probability, but that could lead to really fundamentally new insight. And right. You're, so you're right. We, don't, we don't coach our, resor our, our researchers right. to do that. Right. Too. Falsifiable hypothesis, not false hypothesis. No. Uh, we don't want to spread stories like COVID is a uh, hoax, COVID is a lab created. Right. Any of these things, people should understand and evaluate their ideas about how to respond. 
and what we based on what is true and what is false, being right. able to well, figure that out. The other thing that's missing is the infrastructure that allows us to operate as one collective group more efficiently. So that that was okay. really um, you know hard, and just the sh the sharing piece and the navigation piece. You know, if you have tons of time, you can build a nice website. You can use, you know, Facebook, whatever. You can use all kinds of mechanisms. But, um, you know, we have these silos. <laughs> we have productivity yeah. silos. And when you're trying to go across the silos, it's just really a mess. And, you know, I, I know people like John Towns thinks about this all the time. You know, we've been working on this for 20, 30 years, but we're, we're still really bad at it. You know, if there's one organization, if you're inside one organization that somebody from the top can dictate a set of technologies, you can make it work. But but across disparate organizations and countries and so on, it comes down to lowest common denominator stuff. And uh, that's got to be part of the architecture, uh, you know, yeah. when, when I, you know, the big, big architecture aspects. Um, and, uh, you know, NSF and the agencies uh, held it, you know, NIH and DOE and uh, all the you know, EU agencies and so on that do this kind of stuff and in India and everything. You know, we need a cooperation level to build that kind of high speed, low barrier sharing um, so that, you know, before you try something, you can at least have some sense of whether anybody's tried it before. Um, you know, if somebody's done it a hundred times and it never worked, you know, you might want to try a different idea. Right. And, and so, um, that part has to be part of the environment and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll have all kinds of side benefits as well. Right. As everything else we do besides pandemic preparedness. Right. Right. Well, zoom played an interesting role in doing that. It, it but, did. And, and, it was and, a, it was a slow technology. Right. So many times that we wanted to push a data set through Zoom, it was just not so right. easy. Right? Right. Uh, right. You know, you couldn't drop a, you know, a gigabyte data set into the chat window and say, well, here, you know, here's a, here it is. <laughs> um, you know, and. Uh, right. Well, the data set. You guys, you guys also both highlighted before, like at, at some point, your, your, your global laboratory of researchers yeah. grows in size such that you know even something like a, you know in person meetings or virtual conversations isn't sufficient you need some searchable repository of well yeah of it was interesting we, <laughs> right right after the ad hoc stuff you know doe uh, dropped a bunch of money on the labs uh, for this national virtual biotechnology lab we had eight labs working on small molecule stuff and we even had a team whose job it was to build infrastructure for sharing. And of course, by the time that the project finished a year and a half later, they finally had a prototype, right? So this gives you a sense of like, you know, this is the wrong yeah. speed. Um, so, you know, when, when you're in a, a crisis kind of situation, you need to leverage what's already there. Um, and I think the opportunity here is to build out and I, I mean, I love Bud's com comments about malaria. I would also throw MTB in there because that's the one I work on and it's the same yeah. challenge, right? Kills more people yeah. every year than I mean, need to worry about. Um, and, the, and as well as all the orphan diseases, you know, there's thousands of orphan diseases for which we have some notion of what a drug target is, but we have no effective therapies. Mm -hmm. There's more than enough work to keep hot teams working on infectious disease or other diseases to exercise uh, uh, infrastructure and a set of workflows and, and systems so that if you have a national or international emergency like another pandemic, you can pivot, right? It's th that, that I think is, is so clear in my mind now that, that you know, we pivoted from cancer to, to COVID in a week uh, with 90% of the same people because because you know everybody knew each other and we already had collaborations with with virology people we've been working on bacteria for a long time the drug development stuff was not that dissimilar so the you know and you plug in different people but the idea that that if you're already working and already have some momentum that's what is going to matter right you don't have to spin up from zero and you've got a, a community of people who know each other and trust each right. other to, to to instantly collaborate and that's part of what the nsf prepare activity needs to encode which is how do we create that community how do we resource it how do we challenge it on an ongoing basis and how do we build infrastructure to support it so that the next time we're already running right by the time that we recognize what we have to do 
we already have forward momentum on it and uh, and huge teams of people doing it right and it's just a question of of uh you know solving the new problem as opposed to uh, reinventing all the infrastructure yeah just as another example um reverse transcription etc where initially thought of as a viral explanation for cancer. And it was not true, but it played a big role when HIV came along, right? We people were prepared. Uh, same thing here's, with here's, the mRNA yeah. vaccines. I mean, here's another, uh, this is not a computer architecture, but you know, the, after we got moving on, on our therapeutic uh, development pathways, the big bottleneck was access to compounds. And, uh, you, we would have these giant lists of compounds that we needed. We had labs already ready to like do smile. Screen. And, yeah. you know, it was either synthesis or it was, you know, getting compounds out of Ukraine, right? Because uh, <laughs> we actually had groups synthesizing things. Um, and uh, it took weeks to get, move compounds across the planet when, uh, you know, a lot of standard libraries could have been cached uh, and kept in repositories close by where we do uh, high throughput uh, screens. And if the computational people knew exactly what was in those libraries, you could actually, within a matter of days, prioritize experiments. And the fact that we haven't connected the dots in, in that sense is, is completely insane. When we know how to do it. It's just uh, it's a question of just connecting the dots. So, so Rick, uh, yes. um, when you're working on the drugs for COVID-19, um, what worked and what didn't work? I mean, what worked in terms of, of drugs or? Uh, yeah, yeah, your approaches and- I mean, uh, so we had, so what, you know, we, we had chemists, uh, you know, virologists, crystallographers, computer science, you know, we had all these people, right? And what worked was uh, challenging each group on a, around a target or around a specific strategy to do whatever they could to move the needle. And, and we, so we had dozens of, of development threads going at the same time. Some things were bottlenecked on functional assays, right? The, each of the protein targets in the virus, only a couple of them, we, we had uh, functional assays work running in people's labs. So the chemists and the molecular biologists had to get work on that because you ideally want to test in functional assays before you go into whole cell assays. But for most of the targets, we didn't have functional assays and, we, and, and they weren't ha happening fast enough. And so we went straight to whole cell assays, which is great, except that you don't have confirmation of the mechanism. You can, you can hypothesize about mechanism, but, the, but I say if you get a positive result in the, in the screen, now you have to go back and verify mechanism. So we had to, we still needed the functional assays. We were just trying to parallel process and, and go asynchronous. So we, we did a lot of that. The crystallographers and the cryo EM people, they were super helpful, right? We needed a structure. We need, we had ambiguity on certain structures or new structures that we needed. They were running their labs 24 seven, right? Um, we would get compounds. We say, this is showing activity. We need a co-crystallization. They would try hundreds of experiments in parallel to get that. Um, I mean, everybody was doing the best they could in, in the scheme in which they knew how to do it. And we, people were freely sharing money and sharing, I mean, all that was working great, right? Um, but, and we, we, you know, computing wasn't a shortage. What was, was really, um, you know, in some sense, a challenge was the fact that you you were working on dozens of of drug candidate pathways at the same time, and everything was in a different stage of development. And it was it was a bit challenging to keep track of all of that, right? I mean, you, you know, you would have I would wake up in the morning and I and I would try to get a sense as to on the twenty or so targets we were working on where each thing was at. Um, and of course, to, to Bud's point, you know, you, we had a whole bunch of hypotheses, right? We, and a lot of this biology wasn't well known. You're reading literature every day because a new paper is popping out. You're trying to integrate that and you're trying to do all this in real time. Um, so the computing was a huge part of it, but knowledge synthesis. So this is where I think, you know, future AI things could help us. You know, we, were, we, were, we had deep learning models trying to process literature, trying to pull out uh, drugs, you know, repurposing candidates, mechanistic uh, concepts that we could try uh, to validate in simulations. You know, we would get a, a, a mechanism that a model would tell us maybe is happening. And we'd say, okay, how do we get this validated in the lab? We called up our cancer friends at, at NCI. They got permission to use the cancer lab to do virology experiments, right? It was pretty cool, right? Um, the the <laughs> director of the National Cancer Institute decides, you know, basically over a phone call, 
to let his guys come back in there and shut down the lab to come back in, fire up their lab to do uh, tethered uh, uh, covalent uh, inhibitor yeah. experiments to try to get data to support the simulations and the screening that we were doing. So everyone was, you know, it, it, you know, in a crisis, you kind of, uh, you know, do whatever you can, right? Th that process though was not sustainable, right? People couldn't work 160 hour weeks, um, you know, week after week, right? What's, what's needed in some sense is, is to figure out how do you have a capability to go into that high speed mode if you have to, but have uh, something that's sustainable going on that's making progress on important problems all the time. Right, yeah. so a group of, within um, my COVID group, uh, I think Lakshmi knows some of them, Alfredo Ferro, Ashley Dewitz, um, both uh, immunologists and cancer, bio, cancer bio, systems biologists. Um, they basically created signatures for different molecules in terms of which pathways are affected and try to repurpose drugs, which is significantly easier because you don't have to um, do the candidate screening. Uh, I mean, remdesivir was originally developed for Ebola. So if you are targeting RNA polymerase, then you know the pathways that you have to go through. Um, if, you know, if we know Jack stat plays a big role. mTOR probably plays a role. So, but the, to go to the place where you can actually do clinical, you know, uh, preliminary trials on cell lines or organoids or clinical trial, that's not possible to do within Zoom. But Zoom is actually a pretty good place to, with computers. You could go pretty far. And, uh, and there are uh, efforts to do that in silico. Um, and, I think that will be an important area of the future. Right, I think even before the pandemic, uh, we didn't think that vaccines could be developed so quickly, right? At an average of nine yeah. to 10 years is what we are hearing. And then it was done in uh, 300 days, so. Well, and most I, of that was not the conceptual development, right? I mean, the RNA yeah. vaccines had been sketched out in a few weeks really that was all the scaling up and debugging manufacturing debugging delivery debugging scale up and then the clinical trial you know pre you know, trials right that's what consumed most of that time right um, right so yeah. this yeah. is the thing for, for known virus you know for known rna viruses uh, you could get ahead of the curve by in some sense designing vaccines ahead, ahead of time yeah, um, but there are still challenges. RNA sequencing is easy because of all the work uh, that has been done on sequencing. Um, but cold chain is a big problem. Can you change, change the problem. backbone yeah, to absolutely. PNA or LNA so that they can be transported to Africa or India? Or could you create mRNA synthesis labs in containers that can be moved to those places and could be synthesized there? I think that's uh -huh. it. Yeah. Could, could, right. Could you essentially they still have didn't know. vaccine production capabilities at every right. region, right? Every village has the ability to print its own right. vaccine. Right. And that hasn't worked for HIV. Um, harpies, they have been trying that. It's not, I mean, it's, it wasn't clear if you need a linear single stranded RNA, double stranded RNA will work, circular RNA will work. A lot of that work was uh, uh, done before. And the lipid nanoparticle was a complete new breakthrough, and people are still fighting over patent. Right, and that yeah. that I think is something else we should figure out well, how not to fight over patents. Yeah, that, things I, like I totally that, so that. that somebody can manufacture it cheaply and save lives. Another thing that or, we we haven't talked about, but that was actually we were doing, we were working on it, and, and actually still working on it now is is antibody design and. Uh, computationally, it's got uh, a whole set of challenges. AI is very useful for that. Um, what your modeling is useful. Um, and again, we were bottle we, we actually designed antibodies. We were bottlenecked in assays. We couldn't get our hands, uh, you know, we could design them. Getting the antibodies synthesized was a problem. Getting the antibodies assayed was a problem. Um, so, you Would know, it be possible to do an assay in a a different country like China or India, 
but I think it's well, I, I think absolutely it's possible to do that because companies do it all the time. But yeah. uh, right. it, was, it was difficult for national labs, for example, for me to reach out to China and do mm. it. Just given the no, right. China is not a good idea. Yeah, but you know, IP, but what's yeah, interesting yeah. is that you know, from a computing standpoint, you could think of the whole yeah. process as as a you know complex workflow or job mix, and you apply an Amidal's right. law kind of rule to it and say, okay, we, let's say we make the the, the design part collapse that to instantaneous or the, the virtual screening part instantaneously, what becomes the bottleneck right now? And then you have to hit that, right? The problem is that you can't, you know, there, we do have this notion of, could we go, uh, could we take the entire drug development pipeline of 10 years or 15 years and collapse it down to say a year right. by replacing many experiments with AI. But in order to do that, you have to have training data, you have to have maybe simulations. And so that's another kind of concept that that with enough preparedness, you could do that, right? So for example, toxicity, right? right? You, toxicity right. is something that we can probably model. We, we, we are modeling it and, and yeah. groups are modeling it. Um, and uh, other things, you know, in terms of uh, in drug developments, ADME, absorption, desorption, right. metabolism, excre excretion, so on. Process selection. All of those things, PK, all that could be predicted with AI with sufficient training data and with sufficient uh, complexity of models, right? So, right. Um, and if you had all of that, then the idea would be, could you go from a computationally determined target or a hit or lead compound to a phase one clinical trial in, you know, pick your number, you know, three months, two months, whatever, right? It, could you could you imagine doing that, right? So for vaccines, of course, um, the in, in, the, in the context of COVID, we were actually pretty close to that because the bottleneck wasn't actually, because these RNA vaccines were pretty safe, right? There was not really, right. tolerance was, was soon pretty good. For antivirals though, um, you, you, you don't know, right? It's these already, are, I mean, correct. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so, but you know, if you're really trying to build uh, an infrastructure to save the world, <laughs> you know, you could consider that infrastructure, the AI end-to-end -end AI pipelines that would dramatically compress drug development time. That would be an R and D goal, and you and you. So, so I'm reminded of computer science. I think when I was a graduate student, the interesting things were, of course, DARPA, but there was Moses that yep. lets you design a chip over 24 hours, and Silicon Graphics was designed by a guy who did not know anything about semiconductors, and there was MCC Bobby Ray Inman's effort to collaborate. Something like that, if that can be done for a bio, mm -hmm. vaccine design, drug design, et cetera, it should try. Moses, yeah, uh, Moses, like Moses and MCC. Yeah, absolutely. Because that, that, and let's say then now you get academics able to- People, the young this. people in the group, yeah. so explain what Moses and MCC were. Well, so- Does oh, yeah, everybody so know? Was, well, I, I'll explain it quickly. So this was, this was a, a program that DARPA or ARPA, maybe at the time funded, that allowed academic departments to fabricate chips um, for free um, to right. help uh, train the whole community basically on how to do uh, VLSI design and to get back working chips. Um, and so what would happen is they'd gather all these designs, they'd, they would aggregate them onto wafer, you know, onto runs for specific uh, wafers, might have a you know, two dozen different chip designs, run them, uh, dice them up and get the parts back to the university. So it was kind of a turnkey. You would you would do your design, you do your pre-silicon validation, then you'd hit kind of like print. And then a couple of weeks later, right. you know, you would get the chips. Yeah. Back, right. Yeah. Design rule checkers for toxicity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And organoids and cell lines and mouse model in one place. And you yeah, just you know. send a file and it comes back. Your antiviral work uh, exactly. at this doses. Um, so, so maybe this is not exactly what NSF meant when they said architecture, but we're imagining the whole architecture right, here. It's right, all of this. Right. There's no well, when, I, when, when you talk about the internet, I can't imagine internet without Moses and MCC and DARPA yeah. and Mead and Conway and stick diagrams, uh, design rule checkers, model checkers. There are a lot of stuff that went in. I really like that's the idea of this of this infrastructure that's available to people. And I think the one thing, Rick, as you were just saying, that uh, that sort of sticks with me from this conversation is that this this whole architecture, right, from the community engagement to the HPC to laboratory facilities to knowledge base, has got to be something that that we invest in now and that is up and running the entire time, because 
you know, as, as we said in the prelude to this, this workshop, it's not if it's when, right. And therefore you need to have all those tools, all those workflows, all those integrations, all those learnings primed and ready right. when the next time. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, it, it may not, it may not be ready for next pandemics, but it could compute um, a non-invasive liquid biopsy for cancer and finding tissue type and uh, give HLS specific immunotherapy. Yeah, one, one thing we're thinking about is, you know, there's been this movement towards, um, well, we call it autonomous laboratories, autonomous discovery, but but mm -hmm. cloud labs, right? So Emerald yeah. is a company that's doing this. So CMU is going to build this out. Well, others, uh, and we got projects here at Chicago and Argonne doing this. You know, if you have a lab that you can automate large amounts of it, and if once you get a protocol developed, say for some assays or whatever you're doing, and you can transport it into that lab, you can create an API, right? You can code against this on the outside yeah. and yep. you can open that up. And so in some sense, it is an architecture. It becomes a software architecture with a set of APIs and... Yeah. And um, that separates the back end from the front end. And you can have student, even students working on coding up experiments that get executed by the robotic infrastructure and give them data back. And that allows this, this uh, you know, falsifiable hypothesis testing by huge numbers of, and they, don't, they could be anywhere in the world doing this, right? Yeah, just, just so happens yeah. there's a wet lab behind the API instead of- Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's right. And so that's yeah. the future, I think. Um, it, it's it's the only thing that's ultimately going to scale uh, to allow the creativity, and it's 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 kind of um, you know clear from cloud computing that we know how to do this. Or even I, I when I'm talking to students about it, I say you know it's kind of like like shopping at Amazon. You you have an API or, or at least a website, and you don't really care how what happens on the back end, right? To you, you do something, and you know 24 hours later, or eight hours later, or five hours later, whatever something happens, right? And if, if that back end, and in fact, it's not completely automated, there's people and other stuff happening there, but but for, for molecular biology or for drug development or for therapeutic development, like what we're talking about, that same kind of vision would would have dramatically streamlined what we were trying to do, right? We, right. If, if, if we were able to send protocols in, get these up and running, programmatically dump from, from our models uh, hits, that the computer was saying is interesting. This test all these. Never mind. You know that we're going to get maybe one percent back that actually work. That's fine. You know, um, better than one in a billion, right? So, um, yeah. So the point is that that's very doable. And from an NSF uh, community perspective, this is something that would have great spinoff benefits. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we should let other people ask questions. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I wanted to congratulate everybody for Jack Dongera. You got a Turing Award, right? Do you know Jack? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's so, so the, nice. I, the Turing Award, yeah. Oh, Jack, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Andy, Bod, and Rick, uh, as, you know, for giving such excellent talks and the excellent discussion. I think we have gone um, over the time right. quite a bit. And, um, so we fell cheaply, but not quickly. <laughs> now, thank you very much. And I'm, I'll uh, hand it over to Madhav to, to close the event. Um, Lakshmi, thanks so much. It won't take, us, uh, take me too long to do this. But I first want to thank the three panelists and yourself, Lakshmi, for a very, very different. I came into the session with a very different uh, thought of what this session would be. So they did talk about architectures, but it was a social architecture, maybe instead of the computing architecture, uh, much more so. And I think it's interesting. I think they all, I think that's part of a larger human architecture that uh, that I think uh, is important. And they made a very good point. I, I want to take this chance to also thank NSF. I think Mitra is here, James uh, probably just left. Uh, they've allowed us to do this. And as I said in my opening remarks, the intent here is to collect all this information and uh, take it back to NSF uh, for their consideration because NSF is, is a bottom-up organization. They're looking for ideas and ideas come from panels and discussions like this. And hopefully this will come back to all of us in terms of you know, program calls and such. Um, there has been some uh, suggestion by previous 
panelist in, in a, uh, yesterday to potentially even write an opinion piece or perspective article that synthesizes the, the information. I'm happy to, you know, take a straw poll later on and see whether there's interest because I think uh, that's a good way to synthesize this. We'll of course send a report out, but I think uh, the biggest, I think success for us is that we were able to assemble such an amazing set of panelists uh, yesterday and today and to the, to the program committee members, uh, Lakshmi and, and John and, and my colleagues, uh, uh, Lee is here, Simon couldn't make it, Anil. Uh, Erin and, and Golda, they just outstanding work. So thank you very, very much. This is not the last of the panels. We are going to have another one. Anil, in fact, is already starting to plan the next workshop on vaccine uh, hesitancy, which is going to be interesting. So we plan to run these workshops every few months. And all of you are very welcome. We need your input on how we can grow this, this community, Rick and uh, Baran, and you all talked about human systems, right? And the whole idea of prepare is to build and sort of at least bring people together in an organized form so that if it happens again, uh, we're not looking for expertise and complementary skill sets. Hopefully that will help. So thank you once again. Uh, with this, let's close the meeting and hope to see you folks on the, on the next uh, panel discussion or workshop that we have. Appreciate all the work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.